My name is Ron Stoffer. I'll be bringing the message today, and we will be uh, starting a brief segment before our next book of the Bible. Uh, those of you who've been with me for a couple years know that we went through uh, Matthew, the entire Gospel of Matthew. It took a couple years to do, and uh, then we went into First and Second Thessalonians, and then after that, uh, I believe we did the Book of Ruth, if I'm not mistaken, and then uh, we went into uh, Ecclesiastes, so maybe the book of Ruth was a little further back. We went into Ecclesiastes then, we just completed that study in the wisdom literature of the Bible in the book of Ecclesiastes, and that was, a, that was an awesome study. I really enjoyed that. So we're going to be starting into a new book in just a couple weeks, but before that, I wanted to do something different. I seldom do topical studies, but I thought that this was important to address, and that is we're going to be looking at what we believe, what we believe. This is part one of a couple of weeks, just the introduction, and the title is Creeds and Confessions. I'm not going to teach creeds, I'm not going to teach confessions, but we will look at one creed as sort of a table of contents to dive into what do we believe. <clears throat> Our beginning text for that today will be Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll be in verses 1 through 9, and then move quickly into several other uh, passages. But if you would rise with me to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Lord God, I pray that your blessing on this message today, may it be your words. Uh, Lord, may you uh, restrain my tongue from making errors in this message. And give me the humility to correct myself if I do. God, I pray that you would... Uh, give your Holy Spirit here to everybody in the room so that we would hear with ears to learn from you and to incorporate your truth into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Now as we go through this, uh, we've got the... Uh, Verses 1 through uh, 3, kind of a preface, and then the, the central verse that we want to focus on is verse 4. You may know it as the Shema. You'll probably recognize it when I speak it. And then for context, we'll go uh, verses 6 through 9 after that. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This has been a reading of the Word of God. Lord God, we thank you for this reading of your Word. We ask you to bless it to our hearts and to our minds that we may adhere to your Word, that we may uh, be aware of your commands, and that they would become a part of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks. Please have a seat. <clears throat> so some of you have come from the state of Wisconsin, uh, and perhaps you are a Green Bay Packer fan or were a Green Bay Packer fan. For those of you who are not fans, that's football. 
and uh, there is a there was a, a great team that began in about 1960, well, 60, 59, 60, but really took off in 1961 under the leadership of a coach named Vincent Lombardi, or Vince Lombardi. And there's a very famous quote that people quote of him in business and in the military and in all kinds of places when they want to talk about getting back down to basics. And it's, it's this, that in July 1961, Vince Lombardi kicked off the spring training or the summer training for the Green Bay Packers for the next season after they had just suffered the de a defeat uh, the, the previous year to the Philadelphia Eagles after blowing a great lead in the very last quarter of the game. So they lost the NFL championship. This is pre-Super Bowl. It was called the NFL championship then. And so when the players came back to start training for the next year, they thought, wow, we're going, to, we're going to dive in and learn really advanced techniques to how are we going to not make those mistakes again, and it, nothing could be further from the truth. That's not what the coach had in store for them. They came in, and he seated them all, the players, and said, uh, gentlemen, open your playbooks. And then he took out a pigskin, and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. This is a football. Now, it's like he's talking down to six-year-olds. This is a football. Oh, you didn't know that. Well, it's made of pigskin, and it's about this long and about this round. It's a football. It would seem insulting, but Vince Lombardi was a great leader and a great teacher and a great coach. And he understood this, that if you want to, to excel, if you want to be excellent in what you do, you cannot do it without understanding the fundamentals from the start. You have to build a foundation of firm fundamentals. And he said, open your playbooks, turn to page one. This is where it teaches you about tackling. Bart, get out here. Show me a three-point stance. We're going to do a tackle here. Then blocking then running, and only after all of that is done do you get to touch the football. Because you don't get to touch the football until you know how to block, how to tackle, how to get into the stance. And then later on, we'll deal with the more advanced plays. So this is building a foundation of fundamentals. By the way, they did go on then to win the NFL championship the next year and the next year, and five out of the seven following years, and they won the first two Super Bowls, uh, Super Bowl I and Super Bowl II. We're going to look at the football. Gentlemen, this is a football. The equivalent question is, who is God? Who is God the Father? Who is God the Son? Who is God the Holy Spirit? Before we talk about other doctrines in the faith. It's good to be solid on those points. Now, the reason that our title today is Creeds and Confessions is because the early church, the first three centuries, the first century, second century, and into, into, the, into the 300s then, uh, was a persecuted church. They didn't have time to sit down and write out uh, confessions of faith. They didn't have time or the opportunity to really uh, become organized and unified as a church. They were too busy running away from persecution. In fact, this is how, this is how Christianity spread originally in the first century was the, the, the Christian church was all housed basically in Jerusalem there. And I think the Holy Spirit looked at that and said, this isn't going to work. This is not what we're about. We're not about staying here in a safe place. I'm going to scatter you over all the world. And so, and so he allowed or brought, or however we want to think about it, persecution upon the church and the people scattered. And they went to, they went to the four corners of the earth. The, 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 the saying is, or the belief is, that, that Thomas went to India and founded the church in India. Others went to Spain. Others went to... Uh, the area of France. Others went to North Africa. They were all over the world. 
And however, in the Roman Empire, which was sort of the known world of civilization at that time, which, which spanned a huge area, there was, while the church wasn't unified, the opposition was unified. They had one emperor at a time, most of the time. And those emperors were, most of them, extremely hostile to the Christian faith. Why? Because the, those Christians would not bow down to the image of Caesar and worship Caesar, at least as a god. Caesar was frustrated that they would not include him in the pantheon or the group of gods in the world. Why is that? Because we believe in one God. Why do we believe in one God? Well, we're, gonna, we're going to look at that. We have a 2,000-year tradition of getting to the very basics of the faith in what are called creeds, creedal statements, and confessions, or confessions of faith. So what is a creed? Now, we're not going to study a creed, but we're going to use one as the, sort of the table of contents for our brief study into the basics of the faith so that then we can proceed with the next book of the Bible that we're going to do and build uh, our understanding of the basics of the faith from there. A creed is this. It's a short, simple, basic statement of belief in something or someone. One person has called it a pledge of allegiance. A pledge of allegiance to someone. And, uh, so this pledge is designed, this creed, its purpose is to unite, it is to unify people around a core belief. We think about it in the United States here. We have the Pledge of Allegiance. And at civic events, we put our right hand over our heart and we recite this pledge. Everybody should have it memorized. That's what you do with the creed. You memorize it and then you say it together and then you can look around and say, wow, we all believe and support this one thing. We are united in this. The creed that we're going to look at is called the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Creed. Perhaps you come from a church tradition that would recite the Nicene Creed. We don't do that at, at Calvary Chapel. We go through the Bible, a book at a time, and we study the Bible. But the, the Nicene Creed, which was which was created in the year 325 and then perfected or completed in the year 381 uh, has served for that many years since then as a, a rallying point of what do we believe? What in, in what do we believe? The idea is this, that all Christians everywhere can say yes to this one creed. For that reason, a creed doesn't get off into, I, won't, I don't mean to be flippant about it, but a creed doesn't get off into the rough or into the weeds about other things that are not absolutely 100% essential to the faith. So you're not going to find in the creed eschatology, end times. You're not going to find in a creed talk about baptism. Can you be saved without baptism? Yeah, you can. Ask the thief on the cross. One thing that a creed does is it enables the church to identify who's in the church and who's not in the church. Because if you approach somebody and say, I believe this, do you believe this too? And then they say, yes, I believe that too. There's a, it's not a foolproof, but there's a, there's a very good chance that, that you could call them brother, that you could call them a, a fellow believer in the faith. On the other hand, if they say, no, you know that... Uh, that born of a virgin thing, I, no, nah, I just can't do that. I just don't believe that. Well, that's pretty essential. That goes to who Jesus was. If Jesus was just the son of Joseph and Mary, he's just a, a person like you or I. But that's why, we, that's why we have in our creed, he was born of a virgin and became man. So this week, I'm going to look at a few examples of creedal statements in the scriptures, which is why we started with Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is probably the first creed-like statement 
in the scripture, and basically the only creed statement that people look at the Jews and say, well, if they have a creed, it's probably that, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, the Jewish faith is essentially the first strong monotheistic faith that has persisted in the world to this day. So the Lord is one, or the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. He is the only God, is the idea. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Israel should hear, which means somebody's speaking it. So creeds are always about speaking and hearing. Sometimes they're about writing, because you write them down. But creeds are also crafted and designed so that you can go to a preliterate people and teach them the essentials of the faith and teach them a creed, and they have something to hang on to before they can read or write. Now, it's true that, the, that uh, wherever the Jewish faith has gone and then the Christian faith has gone, virtually every time literacy has followed. The Jews were the most literate people on the planet going way back to Moses' time. Why is that? So that they could read and understand the scriptures. Now, not everybody had books or scrolls to read. So you would go to a place of worship, a tabernacle or a synagogue, and you would and the priest would bring out or the speaker would bring out the scrolls and they would read from the, from the Torah or from the prophets, as Jesus did one time from Isaiah in the synagogue, as, as was his practice. Uh, however, you notice here in uh, verse, verses 6 through 9, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, these words which I command you to today shall be in your heart. So first I want you to write them on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. So how do, you, how do we transmit? Who has the responsibility to transmit the truths of God to the next generation? Hint, the answer is not the church. The answer is the parents. That's the primary people who have responsibility for that. You shall teach them diligently to your children. It doesn't say bring them to the tabernacle and, and have the priest teach the children these commands. It's you shall teach them to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. So this needs to be a topic of conversation. And when you walk by the way, so as you're going about your day, and when you lie down, prayers at bedtime, and when you rise up, prayers upon rising. The Jews prayed, I think it's five times a day, and at kind of uh, ritual prayers, and then, of course, throughout the day, also scattered prayers. And verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And what that was is you would take a leather strap, because you can't, paper's expensive, very, very expensive back then. But leather, not so much. You could take a leather band, and you could write on it a, a scripture, and then wrap it as like a wristband, and then around your hand like this. And you'll see Jews... To this day, even, they have this on their hands. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. They also had uh, uh, scriptures in a little box between, you know, up on their forehead there. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So even if you're too poor to own a book, to own a scroll, which probably 95% of the people were, I'm just throwing out that number, but the vast majority... You can at least take your knife. Somebody did a knife check on me last week. There's my knife. You can at least take your knife and carve the scriptures into your doorposts um, and onto your gates. Now, who sees that? Everybody who ever walks through that door. That's cool, isn't it? It's a good thing to have scripture right on your front door so that everybody who walks into the house I don't know what the scripture would be. It could be whatever you choose. Peace be upon all who enter here. It, it could be, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, which is on the door of our house. So first you learn this, these truths from your parents. Your parents should teach you things like 
Do you know how many gods there are? One. Do you know about God? He's really three persons. Parents, grandparents, you get to teach the Trinity. It's your job. And the church will support you in that. Second, after the parents and grandparents teach the children, then preachers and missionaries teach, uh, teach these truths. Romans chapter 10. Here comes a creedal statement now. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15. How then will they call on him whom they have not, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Sorry, that's not a creedal statement. That's a, that's a statement of how to teach the, creedal, uh, the creed. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, I call to mem- remembrance the genuine faith, the literal Greek of that is the unhypocritical faith, the unhypocritical faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. So Paul is tracing the ancestry of Timothy's faith from grandparent to parent to Timothy. Then he says in in, uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So whatever we teach to the next generation, it's got to be grounded in this, the holy scriptures. Now, here comes a creedal statement in Romans chapter 10, verses, uh, verses 9 through 15, or But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And now here comes the creedal statement. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is an essential point of salvation. It has to do with speaking. If a person will not say Jesus Christ is Lord, that person is probably not saved. It's a pretty good test. It's not foolproof, but it's a pretty good test. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. So Paul is, is acknowledging, you can believe in your heart, but you got to say it too. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So that's why we speak a prayer, Lord Jesus Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe in you. There is a very famous uh, person on YouTube that draws a big crowd, and many people flock to his messages. I'm not going to use his name here, uh, but but he, he talks about religion a lot, and people ask him, do you believe in God? He says, I don't like that question. And because then he goes into a, a... a spiel about why he doesn't like it, but then he claims to be of the Christian tradition. I'm sorry. If you won't confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, it says something about your faith. We have had the privilege here of of seeing some of our brethren go to be with the Lord. And I generally, if I have the opportunity, I offer them the chance to speak at least to this congregation before they die a confession of faith in Christ. If if, If I catch the timing right, if they're available to come here. And and they sometimes they say, This has happened several times. Sometimes it's like, what shall I say? Just say this. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I know that you're already a Christian, but it is important that you confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And when I go to visit someone at home or in the hospital, before they die, if I'm able to, if the opportunity presents, I I then say to them, Do you believe in God? Tell me about it. 
and, and they draw. Generally, they draw upon some energy that they didn't know they had at that time. There's this, there's this sort of awakening that happens, if only briefly, yes, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Well, they've believed in Jesus for decades. But it's good to say, I believe in God. With the heart one believes unto righteousness. You can be righteous just based on what you believe in your heart. But with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Do you see the difference? Yes, technically, I believe that a mute person who does not speak can be saved, of course. But you get the idea. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's another creedal statement. Call upon the name. The name. In 1 Corinthians, we have another creedal statement, a statement of core belief. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, specifically the creedal statement, I believe, is in verse 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, Paul says, Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols or these mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that, and now here it comes, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed or anathema. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, a hypocrite can say Jesus is Lord and not mean it. We, we get that. But his, his point here is this, that the confession unto salvation. And nobody, under normal circumstances, and even most abnormal circumstances, who's really, really a believer in Christ, is going to say that Jesus is accursed. Now, in the, in the Christian history, there's been a lot of persecution. And sometimes that persecution is, I am going to make you curse the name of Jesus. And they do horrible things until that person curses the name of Jesus. Does that damn them to hell? It does not. They've been, they've been forced. This is not a sincere statement of their heart. It's, it's, not a neg it's not a negative confession. Like a positive confession, Jesus is Lord, is unto salvation a forced, a coerced, negative confession is not unto damnation. That's my belief. 1 Timothy chapter 2 has another creedal statement. Verse, verse 5, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity, or reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here's the creedal statement. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Did you catch that? There is how many gods? One God. And there is how many mediators between God and man? And who is that? It's like you memorized the Nicene Creed or something. I have to stay for the record. Mary is not a mediator between man and God. If you think that, if you think that she is, you have some studying to do, and you, there's some things you need to learn. Verse 7, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ, and I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 2 for a final creedal statement that we see in the Scripture. 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, now here comes the core facets of our creed, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus is in the form of God and is equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. This is the incarnation. Jesus, with God, in the form of God, came, says came, in the form of a man. And being found in, the appearance as, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So God who cannot die and cannot be put to death deigned, condescended to come into human form to suffer and to be put to death. He humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which was the most hor horrible death. It's right up there with, it is basically, impalement. I don't know if you've ever studied about um, Vlad the Impaler or Count Dracula in the province of Transylvania. That he would impale people, I'm not going to go into detail, on sticks by the thousands, by the thousands. And the Romans did that too, by the thousands. They hung people on a cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name. It's above how many names? Every name, yes. This is a core creedal statement of our belief, at the, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. Who is that? The dead. All who have died will bow the knee and confess the name of Jesus Christ. Even if they would not do it while they were living, they will do it in their grave. And that every tongue should confess. How many tongues? Every tongue. Even those radically opposed to Jesus today. They will one day confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. To the glory of God the Father. This is our creed. Now, it's located in disparate places all throughout Scripture, beginning in at least Deuteronomy and going all the way up through the end of the Bible. So, how do we teach people these basics short of a 10-year study with J. Vernon McGee <laughs> through the Bible? One vehicle is a creed. I'm going to encourage you all to at least read and learn the only creed. You don't have to memorize it. There's not going to be a test. I've printed them out and put them on the back table back there for after church. Called the Nicene Creed. It's short. It all fits on one page. And take it home, put it in your Bible and look at it. Discuss it. It's going to serve for the next couple of weeks, just a couple of weeks, as the table of contents for us diving into who is God? Who is the Son of God? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is this about his death, his resurrection? What is the church? Now, there's a lot of people today who say, Jesus, yes, church, no. Can you really do that and be a mature believer? We're, we're going to look at that. Now, the early church in Acts chapter 2, the early church was 
very devoted to continuing steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Acts chapter 2, I begin in verse 40. And with many other words, he, that is Peter, testified and exhorted them, that is the people, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That's a serious church growth right there. His people had been waiting for the good news. And they had been waiting for Messiah. And when Jesus rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit fell down upon that early church, Peter preached one simple sermon and thousands of people immediately came to faith. Verse 42, and then they, those 3,000 souls, plus the 120 before that, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Yes, doctrine. It's not boring. It's exciting. We're not going to get way out into the weeds on doctrine. We're going to look at the football and tackling and blocking. Who is God the Father? Who is Jesus the Son? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and teach, the, the teaching and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Doesn't that sound like kind of the basic recipe for a church? It's the people of God who gather together to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. If you do these things, you will be a church. That is a definition, that's a working definition of a church right there. I mean, you may see several things missing there that you think are essential, like coffee. By the way, we have coffee back here. <laughs> Sunday school, children's church, Softball team, these are nice, these are extras. I mean, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So where can we find the apostles' teaching? Hint, a lot of it is right here. Now, there's a whole lot of apostles' teaching that we don't have a record of. Praise God. When Thomas went to India, as I believe he did, we don't have a record of that, that I know of. It's okay. There's a healthy living church in Kerala, India. It's a vibrant, large church in India. They built a huge church in Egypt, believe it or not, in Syria, in Turkey. Sadly, there have been forces recently that have driven most Christians out of these places. Now, so this is, this is what the church is to do, is to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. We don't always do that. I'm going to give an example of being contentious or wanting to argue about the apostles' teaching. It's right here in Scripture. Now, there's a, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to look at uh, discussion about, of all things, head coverings, prayer, prayer caps, um, whether men should wear them, whether women should wear them, should your hair be uncovered, should your hair not be uncovered, and so on. But Paul says, uh, he's, we're going to see that he says, like, let's don't be contentious about this. Let's don't argue about this. And I'm, I'm going to pull kind of a surprise ending on you here because it doesn't end it's not really the way that you might think. So back then, in the first century, the church was mainly, mainly started with Jews, right? And, and they had this history, the Jewish people did, that basically the women basically always covered their hair everywhere. Like it was modesty. You didn't go out shopping without your head covered. You didn't go to prayers without your head covered. And... The, there was nothing in the law, the Jewish law, telling women you need to cover your, uh, or telling men rather, that you need to cover your head when you pray. But there was something in there that, that the high priest wore this hat, a miter hat. You see something similar on the Pope today. It kind of looks like a fish. It's designed to. And the lower priests also wore a special hat 
Well, I'm going to fill in some blanks here. This is, some of this is surmise on my, on my part. If you're all the regular rank-and-file men and you're looking at the high priest and the priests and you've got a bare head, but they get to call the shots. and They're wearing a hat. You look on that and go, I think I want to wear a hat. I think I want to wear a hat. And others who said, like, no, you can't do that. It's not in the law. And so you had factions among men, the hat wearers and the non-hat wearers, the hat not wearers, the hatless. And uh, it continues to this day. Did you know the Jews are still divided on that, whether men should pray with their heads covered? Did you know that? Orthodox Jews, you'll see they've always got their head covered, right? But among Reformed Jews, it's not a thing. They can, but they mainly don't because they don't have to because the law doesn't say to. Now, here's the interesting thing. Among women, it was really not an issue back then, and it has not really been an issue till about 1970, like almost 2,000 years later. I went just for kicks. I went online last night and I looked up uh, show me pictures of church services in 1960. And so I'm looking like at cameras that are looking down on the congregation from the, uh, the mezzanine in the back where the pipe organ is, right? And all the men have bare heads and all the women have bonnets or caps or veils. I don't remember my seeing my mom without a hat or a veil, probably until, I don't know, sometime in the 70s. It was never a contentious thing. Here's, here's how Paul puts it. Paul teaches on a topic, it draws a lot of fire today. He says, uh, but if any, uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians 11. Now I praise you, brethren, that you keep that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So who's he, who's he pointing the finger at? Men. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. And the women believed that too. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. So Paul turns this on its head and goes like, you men think you can do without women? You can't. You women think you can do without men? You can't. We're both dependent on each other. No one is greater than each other. So any differentiation in head coverings, it's not about your value. You're, you're both from each other. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So for this reason, the women ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. He repeats himself. This is so important. He's trying to take it out of the war of the sexes. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things come from God. So judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her as a covering or for a covering. But if any, here's the key. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. What does that mean? Different translations put it this way. If anyone wants to argue about this, we don't have another custom. Or, if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. So he's saying, don't be contentious, don't argue. This is a teaching of Paul the Apostle. Don't argue about it. And today, most of that, it's not an argument anymore. 
So the Christian church accepted that men should take off their hats in church and that women would have some symbol on their head. There's another scripture that says God gives a woman her hair as a covering. So we're not going to get into the details about that. But the idea, the, the core thing we should take away from that is it is not for us to be contentious about the, the apostles' teaching. We don't get to say, Paul, you misogynist you. How dare you? How dare you violate my culture? Here's what, here's what we can say when a, when a teacher says something that's in error, for example. Hey, I disagree with you on that. I think you made a mistake there. Okay. That's good. You, you bring it to his attention, right? But here's, here's how we should not approach it. Is you offended my culture and my sense of fairness and my sense of justice. So you've offended me. So don't talk that way. You know, if a, if a preacher, if an apostle is being faithful to God, we need to obey what he says. It's not for us to say, I don't, it doesn't seem very fair to me. People judge God that way. What do you mean wipe out the entire city of Jericho? Man, woman, child, and animal. How dare you, God? How unjust of you. Really? Aren't you afraid to say that? Blaspheme the name of God and accuse him of being unjust? God is not man. He has his ways. It is not for us to judge him. And so, this brings us full circle to a creed. What can we know for a fact about God? What should we believe as essentials about God? And I hope I've already shown why. It's important. I'm going to give you one more example of why. Here's, here's a place that it would be useful to really be rock solid in your in your understanding of the basics. I, I share this from the Voice of the Martyrs. Have you ever gotten the publication Voice of the Martyrs? It used to be called, a long time ago, um, Christian Mission to the Communist World. And it was started by Reverend Richard Wormbrand in Romania. And then, it, then he changed the name to Voice of the Martyrs. There's a pastor, Pastor Humayun, who led a prayer home meeting in his home in Shiraz. And in 2012, and that's I Iran. That's a hard place to be a Christian. In 2012, secret police stormed in and arrested the pastor and his wife and their 17-year-old son and four other church leaders. The seven Christians were blindfolded, shoved into vehicles, and taken to an intelligence prison for questioning. That's a place you don't want to go in Iran. After days of interrogation, they were moved to a public prison and ordered to keep quiet about why they had been arrested. The guards rightly feared the spread of Christianity among the prison's 6,000 prisoners. But Pastor Humayun and the other believers felt compelled to obey a higher authority. Quote, it would have been uncomfortable just to be quiet and not to talk about Jesus, not to confess him with my mouth, Humayun said. Things would have gone better for us in prison, however. As they shared their testimonies and the gospel with their Muslim inmates, one thing became clear, they were going to need Bibles. Instead of despairing over their imprisonment, the Christians saw an opportunity to spread the gospel among their fellow inmates. So as they shared their testimony quietly with one inmate after another, who were probably mostly all Muslims, they received a variety of responses. Some of them threatened to kill them. Many others listened passively without any response at all, but some showed a sincere interest. One man approached the group on his own and asked if they were Christians and said he wanted to know more. I was simply telling my testimony and telling about the good news of the gospel and stories from the Bible. Here we go. And stories from the Bible. 
whom Yun recalled, God gave me wisdom about who was open and how much to share with them. The Christians' evangelistic efforts angered the guards, however, and whom Yun alone received 20 written warnings to stop sharing the gospel with Muslim prisoners. But despite the threats from guards and inmates, and inmates, that's scary, the believers committed themselves to expanding God's kingdom inside the Iranian prison. Their daily behavior caused the Muslim inmates to wonder what made them so different. So realizing they needed God's word to help sustain them while in prison, the Christians began writing memorized Bible verses on any scrap of paper that they could find. And they encouraged one another by sharing the verses they remembered. During the times when we were under pressure, Humayun said, God was reminding us of these verses and strengthening us through the parts that we memorized. They were encouraged by the assurance in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, that it is God, that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. They gained insight into the purpose of their imprisonment from Psalm 119, especially verse 71, that says, It's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. In Mark 9, 43, Speaking of sin and temptation took on a special meaning for them. Humayun understood the passage of God saying, I brought you here to purify you and to make sure that your life fully belongs to me, even if you are in the fire. I want to refine you too. After 37 days, Humayun's son, Nima, was released from prison, and then he became the caretaker for his 10-year-old sister who had been staying with relatives since her parents and brother were also arrested. Seven months later, Humayun's wife was released. Eventually, the five remaining in prison were allowed to call their family and friends, and they asked them, the friends, to write down chapters of scripture in English and give them to an imam who visited prisoners regularly in the form of a letter. Here's the key. The guards and the imam couldn't read English, so they thought it was just letters. They were assembling a holy Bible in the prison from memory and from people just writing out key passages. Now, if you were going to help rewrite, not rewrite, not, not refashion, but to summarize the, the key core doctrines of the faith that those Muslims need to hear, what would you choose? Would you focus on baptism? Would you focus on head coverings? Would you focus on smoking or drinking or what would you focus on? One God and His Son, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. These are the things that you would bring. Many came to faith in Christ in that Iranian prison. Eventually, Reverend Humayun was released. At first, they sent him to hell. It was the basement of the, inter of the prison with 200 violent prisoners serving life sentences and on death row. They called it hell. That's what the inmates called it. And that's what the guards called it. They were waiting, many were waiting hanging for their worst crimes. Inmates made knives out of cans and other pieces of metal to protect themselves and murders occurred every week. Humayun's bed was covered with blood. It was a graphic reminder to him. Even the guards in hell had developed a devastating weapon of their own. They used each prisoner's weakness as a means to control him. Humayun was an ex-addict. So they put Humayun in with other addicts, and they gave them all the heroin and drugs that they wanted. So these other inmates could shoot up or snort up these drugs in front of Humayun. But God gave him the ability to resist. Armed with his handwritten Bibles and constant prayer, Humayun withstood the temptation. He said, it didn't happen. I didn't give in by God's grace. Not only that, but a few of the drug addicts stopped using drugs because I reached out to them. Humayun didn't have long to share the gospel with each inmate because many were executed after just a few weeks in hell. In addition to seeing prisoners break the chains of addiction, he rejoiced to see several of them find eternal life in Christ Jesus before they were hanged by the neck until dead. These people gave their life to Jesus. And now we know that the gospel is in the heart of that prison. This story goes on. I won't continue. Wow. 
why do we need, or why do we benefit from a creed? It at least serves as an outline of what we believe. So I encourage you to take this home. This is the Nicene Creed. I'm going to read it to you as I close. This will be my, our closing prayer. Oh, and by the way, I also put the Calvary Chapel Association Confession of Faith on the back table. We'll talk about that next week. We're not going to study it, but you can take that home too. It's really long and has a lot of scripture in it. Here's the Nicene Creed, first written in 325 A.D. at the First Council of Nicaea, then revised and expanded in 381 at the Second Council of Nicaea um, upon the legalization and normalization of the Christian church in the West under the first Christian emperor, Constantine. It goes like this. And by the way, there's going to be some words in here that are different from what you maybe memorized. It's not because the creed has changed. It's because people, it was originally written in Greek. So there's different ways to translate the Greek. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial, or you may know, of one substance with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic. Don't get hung up on that word Catholic. It's universal. It means the word universal. I, you could say that. I believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church, parentheses, devoted to the apostles' teaching. One holy, universal, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, none of that is a quote of Scripture. It's a mini-sermon summary about the essentials of the faith. Can you be saved without this? Yep. Is it a s essential to read it every week? Nope, it's not. It's good to know about. And it will be our table of contents for the next very few weeks as we dive into one God, Father Almighty, one Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for, for those several hundred Christian bishops who got together in 325 A.D. in Nicaea, Turkey, and argued, debated, and crafted this creed. And we th thank you, Lord, for a reconvention of that council in 381 at which every church in the known world accepted the creed, except for a few that they, fo they then followed up within the next couple of decades, and they accepted this creed, Lord. This is a unifying statement of Christians. This is what unites us. It speaks to what unites us, Lord. And we ask you, God, to, in this time of increasing persecution in the world, to unite your church and not allow us to become divided, disheartened, or apostate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to pick these up on the back table on your way out. I'm going to stick around for whoever wants to talk. <laughs>